Let me just remind you of a bonus for all of you who are here today, our, our meeting attendees. Um, uh, you can watch the full version of the soon-to-be-released documentary film In Search of Resolution uh, from director-producer Robert Fry and the Nuclear World Project. Robert is here. Uh, he and his team have uh, generously uh, made this, um, this great documentary um, available for all of you at the uh, website link uh, that's on, I think it's page 13 of your program. And that's available through the weekend. So you know, if you're running short on your Netflix, um, if you can't find a good movie at the theaters, this is the thing to watch. You will see some of the people who are in this room featured in this film that uh, reviews uh, some of the uh, key events in the nuclear weapons field um, through the course of uh, beginning in early 2022 up until very recently. Um, so now I'm very pleased uh, to welcome our launching keynote speaker, <clears throat> who's been kind enough to travel all the way to Washington, D.C. from the European continent. Uh, I'm sorry that we don't have European weather for you today. It had been a beautiful uh, month of May, but June has arrived, and uh, we're back to Washington summer. Um, but uh, we're very pleased to have Ambassador Alexander Kement, uh, who's the Director of Disarmament Arms Control Nonproliferation at the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Many of you probably know him as one of the key architects of the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and as the president of the first, and I would add very successful, meeting with states parties to the TPNW that was held in Vienna uh, exactly a year ago. Um, and it produced a very powerful political statement um, that uh, had a particular resonance uh, then uh, and uh, resonates uh, even today. And I'm sure Alex is going to talk more about that. Um, you'll remember that, uh, many of you remember, not everyone, that Alex was also among the group of key diplomats from the disarmament delegations of Austria, Brazil, Ireland, Mexico, New Zealand, South Africa, and Costa Rica, who the Arms Control Association and many of our members and friends online voted um, uh, as the 2017 Arms Control Persons of the Year for their efforts to secure the treaty. And Ambassador Komet also received the same honor in 2014 for his efforts to organize the third international conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons um, in 2014, which provided a great deal of momentum for the TPNW uh, negotiations. And you can read his account uh, of all of this in the 2021 book on the TPNW, uh, How It Was Achieved, Why It Matters. Um, uh, it is a very good uh, diplomatic history uh, that I would consider a must read. And the treaty does matter. Uh, it has already reframed the global debate on nuclear weapons and I would add has reinforced the uh, taboos against nuclear weapons, particularly uh, the taboo against nuclear threats at a very perilous time. Uh, but in addition to the TPNW, for which uh, many of us know Alex, uh, we have to remember he's been involved in virtually every aspect of multilateral um, arms control, nonproliferation, and, and disarmament for his government in Austria for many years, from the CTBT, uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Cluster Munitions Convention, the Mine Ban Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention, export controls, uh, the ongoing debate about lethal autonomous weapons at the CCW, uh, just to name a few. So we've asked Alex here today to provide his perspectives and that of uh, many in the non-nuclear weapon state majority about this moment of nuclear peril uh, that the world finds itself in, what steps can be taken uh, to walk back from the brink. So Alex, um, thank you for being here. Come up to the stage and uh, as we did this morning, we'll have time to take a few questions from the audience, actually more than a few. So thanks for being here. Thanks. Well, thank you, Daryl. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation to um, be a speaker at the Arms Control Association meeting. It's a great honor. I really appreciate the opportunity as an Austrian diplomat to be able to speak to you on such a crucial global issue. I will speak in my personal capacity 
So my remarks are not necessarily the position of Austria. But when I thought about this speech, I wanted to try to contribute to the discussion in DC, the perspective that I believe is widely shared among the non-nuclear majority of states. I think the much needed US leadership on these issues requires better understanding and more engagement with these perspectives. It's a perspective that goes beyond the 92 states that have signed or ratified the TPNW, or the 125 states that vote for it in the UN General Assembly. At the last NPT review conference, 150 states, non-nuclear states, joined again a humanitarian consequences statement. It's a perspective of concern that the nuclear sword of Damocles still hangs above humanity with existential nuclear risks imposed on the entire international community, concern about the apparent inability of nuclear armed states to extract themselves from a security paradigm based on the threat of mass destruction. It's also a perspective informed by significant new research and facts about humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons as well as the risks associated with these weapons. This perspective is thus based on profound arguments and on legitimate security concerns. Nevertheless, it is mostly disregarded in the international security and nuclear weapons discourse that is, of course, dominated by geopolitics and strategic relations of the major military powers. But there is a whole world out there in the nuclear debate beyond US, Russia, and China. The result has been an increasing disenfranchisement and a deep sense of injustice about the nuclear treaty regime and the nuclear status quo. And the TPNW should be understood as the majority of non-nuclear weapon states wishing to democratize this discourse and claim agency on one of the gravest existential and civilizational risks to, the human, uh, to humanity. Nuclear risks were, of course, on the rise long before the Russian invasion in Ukraine and the subsequent implicit but unmistakable nuclear threats issued by President Putin and others. And uh, Jake Sullivan uh, went through the list this morning. But this, the already disconcerting state of affairs is, of course, dramatically compounded by Russia's irresponsible nuclear rhetoric and the potential for nuclear escalation in the war in Ukraine. We hear much talk about the use of tactical weapons as if this would be somehow not so bad. The use of nuclear ri weapons risks being normalized and the taboo against the use of nuclear weapons looks increasingly fragile. And fittingly, the doomsday clock has now been set to 90 seconds before midnight, which is the closest it's been since 1947 when the clock was started. So this is a very dangerous situation and the non-nuclear majority of states watches in disbelief how geopolitics slides the world back into a perilous phase of high risks of nuclear conflict. We now are at the fork in the road on this nuclear weapons issue, and either the conclusions that states will draw from this situation and the current crisis is an even stronger emphasis on nuclear weapons. And we've heard about this in the morning. This will likely take us down the path of more competition, of new nuclear arms races, more proliferation, pressures, and further increasing global nuclear risks. The non-nuclear majority hopes that this moment of heightened nuclear dangers leads to an alternative conclusion, that it has brought into sharp focus the fragility of nuclear deterrence, that the situation in Ukraine is so much more dangerous because of nuclear weapons that nuclear arms races must be avoided, and that this increases concerns about the sustainability of the nuclear weapons st status quo and that a paradigm shift is needed. And a paradigm shift would need two things. A critical reassessment of the veracity of the arguments that underpin nuclear deterrence, and a weighing of these arguments against the empirical evidence on the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons. And this is what non-nuclear weapon states are demanding and what is now enshrined in the TPNW. Nuclear deterrence requires, of course you know this, the capability to impose unacceptable costs and the resolve to use these capabilities. 
Without the belief in this resolve, nuclear deterrence theory doesn't work. And of course, the assumption is that, that the threat will suffice to deter and that escalation and conflict be avoided. In short, the more credible the threat of nuclear weapons use is, the more the non-use of nuclear weapons is assumed. This leads to what was called the crazy reality that nuclear deterrence is a scheme for making war less probable by making it more probable. Even the horrendous concept of mutually assured destruction is used in the abstract and is constructed as an argument of validation for nuclear deterrence and its assumed outcome, namely deterrence stability and the non-use of nuclear weapons. Deterrence is seen as the ultimate security guarantee, believed to have prevented nuclear conflict in the past, to do so in the current circumstances and in the foreseeable future. This is a deeply entrenched belief, and nothing must challenges, challenge it. But the problem is that in reality, we lack the hard empirical evidence. Nuclear deterrence is a theory. It assumes and projects actions, intentions, consequences, and expected outcomes. We can't prove that nuclear deterrence has worked in the past or will work in the future, just as much as we, as we can't prove that it has not prevented conflict in the past and will not do so in the future. Even a clear deterrent success in a particular crisis would not prove that in the next different context it would work again. And like any belief system, Nuclear deterrence depends on assumptions and carries within it the risk of overconfidence and a potential confirmation bias. And the frequently asserted, uh, used assertion that nuclear deterrence works because of the consequences of nuclear weapons is in itself a perfect example of the assumption of non-use and the demonstration of a potential confirmation bias. By contrast, we do have a lot of empirical evidence and a growing body of research on the broad range of humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and of the risks of accidents, miscalculations, and human or technical error. All the research and new modeling that I've seen concludes that the consequences of nuclear conflict are graver and more complex and likely global. The same goes about nuclear risks. All experts that I've heard are concerned about increasing nuclear risks, the difficulties of understanding and of controlling such risks. Would it not be prudent to base policy decisions regarding nuclear weapons primarily on these empirical facts rather than on assumptions that underpin deterrence and that are ultimately fraught with uncertainties? The effectiveness of nuclear deterrence is uncertain, but we know for sure that nuclear deterrence can fail. And if it fails, we do have the evidence that it likely fails catastrophically and with global impact. And the whole world carries the risks of nuclear deterrence failing. It brings high risks for the security of all other countries whose populations could end up as collateral damage in much more severe ways than previously assumed. And this raises profound legal, ethical, legitimacy, as well as international and intergenerational justice questions. So what are we to do with irresponsible nuclear threats such as what we see currently from Russia? First, clearly, and John Wolfsell said this today, the unlawful aggression by a nuclear weapon state depository of the NPT and permanent member of the Security Council using nuclear blackmail to cover its actions must not end up being successful. Among the many other unacceptable results, it would profoundly damage any notion of nuclear restraint and create a massive proliferation incentive. The restraint as shown by NATO of not engaging with, NATO, uh, uh, with, with Russia's strident nuclear rhetoric was laudable and crucial. Equally important are the focus on non-nuclear deterrence through the most comprehensive set of sanctions and efforts to rally the international community against Russia's actions and support of Ukraine. Nevertheless, the nuclear deterrence aspect does play a big role in NATO's response to Russia, as also confirmed this morning. And of course, it's understandable. Uh, it's an understandable reaction in the face of irresponsible and such aggressive behavior. But this response also compounds and perpetuates nuclear risks. 
This response is logically also based on the resolve to use nuclear weapons with the risk of global consequences and gravest violations of international law. The fact that this position is grounded, as I highlighted before, in the assumption that nuclear weapons will not be used in the end does not change this. For the non-nuclear states, this goes to the core of the legitimacy deficit of nuclear deterrence practices. Are any nuclear threats responsible in the light of what we know today about the humanitarian consequences and risks of these weapons? What in terms of humanitarian consequences can be considered as acceptable, and especially for whom, and based on what legitimation? And what kind of security and, what secu and security for whom are we talking about in such a context? An approach that is based on my nuclear threats is responsible, while yours is irresponsible, is not so convincing from this perspective. At this moment of very high nuclear risks and in the face of Russia's aggression, the international community should really strive to be united. United in one, reinforcing the taboo against the use or threat of use or nuclear blackmail. Two, united in taking all actions to reduce nuclear risks. And three, united in recommitment to the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime and to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we see how the belief in nuclear deterrence creates an in inherent tension and difficulty to do this in a credible way. On the taboo, states parties of the TPNW, Daryl alluded to this, have done their share to reinforce the taboo and express their clear condemnation about any use or threat of use. In their joint declaration adopted last year in Vienna, they stated, I quote, we are alarmed and dismayed by threats to use nuclear weapons and increasingly strident nuclear rhetoric. We stress that any use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is a violation of international law, including the Charter of the UN. We condemn, in, we, we condemn unequivocally any and all nuclear threats, whether they be explicit or implicit and irrespective of the circumstances, end of quote. This is the clearest and most unequivocal internationally agreed statement on this issue to date to solidify the nuclear taboo. The G20 joint communique last September was also an important step. It stated, I quote simply, the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. It was obviously a compromise between those who wanted to be as unequivocal as the TPNW and those who wanted to condemn only the actions of Russia. The recent G7 statement, though, walks the condemnation of nuclear threats back somewhat compared to the G20 statement. Russia's actions, uh, irresponsible actions and policies are rightly co condemned, but overall, it is a joint statement in support of and conditioned by nuclear deterrence. So there is a tension between nuclear deterrence policies and the ability of the international community to categorically reject nuclear weapons as an instrument of policy and coercion. We see a similar tension on the issue of risk reduction. For non-nuclear states, the humanitarian consequences of nuclear explosions are the risks to which they are exposed to. They want to see risks reduced by taking nuclear weapons as far away from any use or accident as possible. In addition to the elimination of nuclear weapons, which is, of course, the risk reduction gold standard, it would mean measures such as de-alerting, de-targeting, taking weapons out of operational service, no first use commitments, among others. Nuclear weapon states, by contrast, give dominance to strategic risk reduction, understood as countering risks that could undermine nuclear deterrence relationships. Consequently, this focus is to make nuclear deterrence work less risky, rather than consider the risks of the practice of nuclear deterrence itself. This limits the range of risk reduction measures considerably. Measures that restrict the ability to use nuclear weapons, such as the one non-nuclear weapon states advocate for, are not supported. They are assessed as having a negative impact on the credibility of nuclear deterrence. Risk reduction measures are thus cons considered only insofar as they do not impact the nuclear deterrence calculus, leaving aside that nuclear deterrence itself is the origin of nuclear risk. 
On the third element, the non-proliferation and disarmament regime recommitment and to the goal of a world without nuclear weapons. Picking up on what I heard this morning, I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan's comments on, on, on the importance of arms control and on the readiness of engaging with Russia and China without um, preconditions. But the future of arms control is, of course, similarly conditioned by nuclear deterrence. No surprises here, but I just want to point out that there is an NPT obligation on all the nuclear armed states to engage in negotiations to end the arms race and achieve disarmament. And not following through on this is in contradiction to the NPT. The overarching conditionality was again obvious at the recent NPT review conference. Yes, Russia blocked the outcome document, but what was on the table for adoption was deeply disappointing for non-nuclear weapon states for non-nuclear weapon states, because nuclear weapon states are not ready to conceptualize nuclear disarmament in any other way than as an aspirational goal to be achieved maybe in a distant future, in a future security environment where nuclear weapons may not be needed. But there are no credible plans how to actually achieve this goal. And all steps that have been talked about in the NPT for many years are qualified by the need to maintain nuclear deterrence, which in practice has meant that no progress is being made at all. This is what undermines the NPT and will possibly ruin it in the long run. There are certainly differences among the nuclear weapon states, with some being more engaged and more transparent. And I acknowledge that the US under this administration is doing this. But the general approach in the NPT is to manage the status quo and prevent any measure that would actually demonstrate readiness to move away from reliance on nuclear weapons. So the urgency that non-nuclear weapon states see and would like to be translated into leadership is not there. Let me conclude by asking the question, how long can we continue to assume that nuclear deterrence will hold? We see Russian roulette being played at the moment. How can we be confident of this in the future? In tensions with China, with the DPRK, or between India and Pakistan, or in a potential Middle East proliferation context? Can it be considered as realist to continue to bet on deterrent stability? Or is it maybe, in reality, wishful thinking based on rather flimsy evidence many assumptions and uncertainties, and the risk of confirmation bias. Trying to find a normative and political way out of the security paradigm strikes me as urgent, but also as realist and prudent, a response to the evidence on the consequences, should the high-risk the high risk nuclear deterrence bet fail. The TPNW codifies the delegitimization of nuclear weapons because of their un unacceptable humanitarian impact and risks. This is based on serious evidence and is a way to help the international community to conceptualize a change in perspective on these weapons. Because ultimately no responsible state should ever find the use of this most indiscriminate and destructive weapon acceptable and the same must go for the threat of use. The TPNW, of course, is not a silver bullet answer for future security challenges, but nuclear deterrence most definitely is no silver bullet either, and certainly not a sustainable one. In these extremely dangerous times, we need leadership and we need cooperation. The TPNW is a constructive and serious investment into international law, and the common security of all. I, I appreciate Jake Sullivan's comments about the shared objective when he was asked this question today. But irrespective of the different legal views regarding nuclear weapons, all responsible states should engage constructively on the profound arguments and legitimate and global security concerns that are now expressed in the TPNW. The shared objective can only be achieved if together we find a way out of this precarious security paradigm. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex. Um, that's an extremely thought-provoking presentation. Um, we have ample time for questions. Uh, as per our usual procedure, you have nice little notepads in front of you um, until such time as I have some of those before me to offer to Alex. Um, I have a couple of questions I wanted to put to you um, that occur to me um, based on your, your remarks. You just mentioned um, National Security Advisor Sullivan's answer to uh, the question that was put to him about the TPNW. Um, and what I heard from him is that the approach represented by the TPNW and the approach laid out in his speech uh, both uh, are aimed at achieving the same goal, a world without nuclear weapons. Um, in your view, I mean, what other commonalities are there in the, in the approaches that are being presented, uh, pursued by non-nuclear weapon states and the nuclear weapon states? And in particular, um, you know, how would you address the question of how the TPNW is or is not compatible with the Non-Proliferation Treaty? Thanks. Um, easy question to start. Uh, I think the concern that many non-nuclear weapon states have is that we will not be able to get to a world without nuclear weapons with the concept of nuclear deterrence. Um, and I think it's not implausible to answer uh, to, to, to see it that way as long as these weapons are considered as something that one must have as ultimate security guarantee how can we make the argument to give it up so the only, the only way to, to be able to achieve this is to conceptualize it differently and I'm personally convinced that the evidence on the consequences and risks makes this argument, makes it convincingly, so that if nuclear weapons are looked at through that prism rather than the ultimate security guarantee, it helps make this conceptual switch. So um, I don't doubt the objective broadly shared objective of wanting a world without nuclear weapons. I don't see from nuclear weapon states, and one should not put all those together because there are very diff there's a broad range of views among the five, and then, of course, among those that are outside the NPT. But I, but I, but I do not see um, the ability and also not the readiness to really take this step take a directional step away from, the, from this security paradigm. And without that, I don't think we will be able to make progress. So the TPNW, um, I think, helps because it adds um, a political and legal dimension to the debate. And uh, that's the plan, not just the debate more into this uh, direction. On the, on the relationship between the TPNW and the, and the and the, and the NPT, arguments that have questioned that uh, and have asserted a conflict or a contradiction, in my view, have been politically motivated and never backed up by, um, by uh, real points. And TPNW states parties have gone out of their way to uh, demonstrate that uh, and make the argument convincingly, and I encourage everyone to also look at the documents that we have produced um, uh, on this issue. It's very clear the TPNW is a contribution to nuclear disarmament, so it is an effective measure to Article 6. And the stigmatization of nuclear weapons because of their terrible humanitarian consequences is a powerful contrib con con uh, contribution to non-proliferation. So two of the core objectives of the of the NPT are clearly supported by the NPT, uh, by the by the by the TPNW. So, lastly, the performance of TPNW states parties at the NPT review conference. Um, clearly working very hard to achieve an outcome and being ready to go along with a very subpar uh, outcome document demonstrated 
The NPT has many problems, but the TPNW is not one of them. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we've got some good questions here. Um, one relates to um, what you said regarding how the nonproliferation treaty could be ruined. I don't know if that's an exact quote in the long run if the current status quo uh, prevails and we don't see movement towards the fulfillment of objectives. You also mentioned the fact that it's all five NPT states parties that have nuclear weapons and all NPT states parties that have Article Six disarmament obligations. So, I mean, putting your, your disarmament ambassador hat on and looking forward at the next nonproliferation treaty, uh, PropCom and beyond, I mean, what uh, needs to be done in order to uh, address the disarmament deficit that hasn't already been tried? And uh, to the question that's here, I mean, what are the long run, long term risks if uh, we don't see uh, the five nuclear armed NPT parties engaged in good faith negotiations to end the arms race? If we see this doubling down on nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence, it means clearly and signals clearly to the NPT membership that the implementation of Article 6 is only sliding further into the distant future. Uh, and it is a fundamental credibility challenge to, to the NPT. And it is, um, uh, it is simply now a very long time since the um, decisions and okay. commitments uh, and obligations were agreed to in the NPT with very little progress. So um, the, I think the only positive outcome at the last DRAFCON was the support that non-nuclear weapon states still very clearly demonstrated for the NPT. But I don't think this can be taken for granted forever. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big challenge and extremely worrying, particularly for countries like mine, whose security policy is to a large extent the building up of international law and multilateral structures. Uh, so that is, um, that, is, uh, uh, um, that, that is deeply worrying. Um, on the second question, what needs to be done? I think we have to have an honest discussion in the NPT. Part of the problem is that uh, the differences that are clearly there, they are profound political differences. Uh, and they are being brushed over traditionally in creative diplomatic language, in outcome documents that are either walked, walked, walked away from on the next day or that can be interpreted into in entirely contradictory ways. For instance, one term in the NPT context is undiminished security for all. Yeah? It sounds, it's, it's a wonderful context. It, it's a wonderful expression. Who could disagree to it? It's become, it's become code for measures that are agreed on nuclear disarmament being conditioned by nuclear deterrence, which in reality then means that if not all five are ready to take them, none of them takes them. Um, so um, we have to have a discussion about what steps are possible and why they are not possible. And that comes probably at the expense of the illusion that we all share the same goal because we might not actually share the same goal to the extent as, as is being presented. But I think for the NPT, it's much more damaging to continue with this kind of brushing over and we have an agreement uh, presenting this as a success, they never implement it because they don't actually mean uh, the same thing to everybody. And I would just add, as somebody who's observed NPT review conferences uh, since 1995, um, I mean, as, as non-governmental organizations and analysts, the work that needs to be done to influence these conferences occurs in the months and years ahead of the conference. And the conference is really a representation of where the states are in that moment in history. So we need to be thinking ahead um, much further uh, than we ordinarily do uh, at these NPT review conferences. All right, um, some of these questions are gonna be hard, some are gonna be a little easier. I think the next one is gonna be a little easier for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, there are a couple questions about uh, what progress has been made since the first uh, MSP, that is Meeting of States Parties of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, to establish a competent 
uh, authority to verify and monitor compliance with the TPNW. Um, and uh, if you can comment, I and mean, we're at early stages, I mean, what, in your view, what kind of verification regime would be required to ensure there would be a world without nuclear weapons? And maybe you can comment on the development and progress of the other um, uh, milestones and deliverables that came out of that first MSP in mm. Vienna. In my outreach before the first meeting of states parties, I engaged with a lot of skeptics, uh, and it was really interesting to see how little um, they knew about what the TPNW was really about. Uh, the expectation was, I think, that this would be a kind of NGO party uh, uh, with lo lots of NATO bashing. Uh, it was then surprising for them, I think, to see that it was a very substantive meeting and that we are embarking with all the resource limitations that, that the TPNW membership has on building gradually, slowly, a regime, a treaty regime. So we have taken significant decisions at the first meeting of states, but it's not just on the political level. Um, there is, of course, a um, uh, the TPNW foresees two pathways for nuclear armed states to join. Uh, this is something that is obviously not happening in the very near future. We are realistic about that, but we need to be prepared for that. We have started a serious discussion on what, uh, what verification in the TPNW framework would look like. Because verification from a nuclear armed state that joins the TPNW is a state that has recognized that nuclear weapons should be gotten rid of. That is a different approach to verification than is normally discussed. I think it will be over time, and we can't go as fast as many would because we have these resource limitations, but I think this will be a very interesting contribution to the broader debate on verification. Obviously, the TPNW is supportive of verification, but obviously the TPNW was not a comprehensive nuclear weapons convention that foresaw a comprehensive verification regime. It was a prohibition treaty, similar like the Biological Weapons Convention, for example. Yeah? That's a prohibition treaty, and we've been trying to do something on verification ever since it was adopted. The TPNW foresees verification, and of course will want to um, deal with that uh, in future uh, protocols and instruments. So that is a discussion that is ongoing in working groups. Very important focus of the TPNW is the humanitarian dimension. We have, the treaty has positive obligations on victim assistance and environmental remediation. The injustice that has been done specifically to indigenous communities through nuclear testing is uh, striking. And uh, several of them are states parties to the TPNW. Kazakhstan, for example, or the Pacific Island states. This is an important, concrete contribution that the TPNW is doing, and we're embarking on how to operationalize this. Um, universalization, of course, is a big focus. But then also an innovative uh, thing that we did is the establishment of a scientific advisory group with a very flexible mandate, which I hope will be an interesting contribution to the broader debate. It is not merely giving scientific advice to questions that states parties ask, but this group is engaging, is tasked to engage proactively with, uh, with stakeholders outside, certainly on the verification uh, uh, aspect, but also related to the, uh, to the other underpin underpinning issues what is out there in terms of research on humanitarian consequences and risks. And I think this could be, uh, over time, a very important uh, contribution to the debate. Um, um, I think I've gone on for too long anyway. <laughs> That's great. Now, we have several, we've got several good questions. Um, these are great folks. Um, well, so you're here in Washington, D.C., um, the capital of one of the nuclear weapon states. Uh, the U.S. government has not been uh, enthusiastic so far about the TPNW. Um, uh, <laughs> and you and I have had this conversation uh, many times over the last few years. Um, you know, signing and ratifying a treaty is kind of the ultimate expression of support for a treaty. Uh, but uh, as we all know, you know, we're involved in a 
all too gradual process, um, what kinds of measures, steps, forms of engagement would you welcome um, as an architect of the TPNW from the nuclear weapons states in engaging with the TPNW states parties, either in the, the meetings or in other ways uh, to, to help build the bridges and, and, and form a, a, a common uh, view about what needs to be done and how? That's a very important question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm being asked that. Um, the, the, the opposition against the TPNW sort of coming into existence was really fierce. Um, and the reason is worry about um, the challenge to nuclear deterrence, worry about um, creation of international, of customary international law. So I think nuclear weapon states to a different degree were really adamant to demonstrate at every moment, at every turn, that, that they are persistent objectors to whatever comes out in the future. I think that point has been made clearly. Uh, the TPNW will only be uh, legally binding for states that join it, and we're far away from any argument that can be made that this is customary international law. So also, the treaty has now come into existence, so the, the tactics <clears throat> of trying to prevent it has not worked. It is now part of international law. I think it is incumbent to um, democratic uh, states, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, to engage constructively with new treaty communities that have come into existence through a due UN process, even if they do not join. There are many treaties that do not have universal membership. Uh, so, to answer your question briefly, it is constructive engagement on the underlying issues. We can have different views on the legality, on the legal side, on the prohibition dimension. But there is a very profound set of arguments that underpins this treaty, which we actually have not had much engagement with. Uh, on the humanitarian consequences, on the fact that there is no credible response capability if something goes wrong. So these are, this is not a naive request. These are legitimate security concerns of states who see um, their populations potentially being collateral damage to the nuclear weapons uh, practices if, it, if something goes wrong. So it is necessary to engage. So I think part of the sort of difficult prehistory of the TPNW, okay, let's turn a page and let's have a constructive engagement. Uh, and we haven't really seen that thus far. We have seen, and I really want to acknowledge this very clearly, a different tone from the US administration, certainly compared to the previous one. Uh, there is no open criticism against the TPNW. Nevertheless, for example, there is still pressure being put on states not to ratify this treaty. There is still pressure put on international organizations not to engage with the TPNW. So all these things, I think, should stop uh, and, and, uh, um, and uh, be part of, a, of, a, sort of moving to a more respectful, constructive engagement while disagreeing on, on the legal points. All right. Thank you. All right, we have a couple of questions about the um, fact that the, the TPNW is one of the rare uh, international treaties that uh, is centered on the impact of uh, the weapon system, in this case, uh, the risks of nuclear weapons use, the effects of nuclear weapons testing uh, through the decades, and has involved um, impacted communities, in the case of the TPNW, um, Habaka Shah. Um, and you know, given that you were uh, the, the the lead diplomat for two humanitarian conferences, I mean, if you could just describe how that facet may be important going forward, and in particular, how could that be useful in uh, opening up the aperture for conversations in countries like China that mm -hmm. are less open, like Russia that are less open, uh, in India, which is democratic in theory, but has a very strong nuclear culture. Um, how can this be helpful? I absolutely acknowledge the difficulties of engaging on those issues with uh, Russia, China, and uh, um, uh, DPRK is even yet another uh, dimension because of the 
the different culture of, uh, of debate and, uh, and, of course, involvement of civil society. Nevertheless, it's also clear that TPNW doesn't have the stranglehold or the exclusive rights to the discussion on humanitarian consequences and risks. And, of course, we see a much, uh, lots of discussion on risk reductions, even though, as I pointed out, the focus is different. So there are, I think, plenty of entry points uh, to have a conversation about those issues, uh, um, about better understanding the humanitarian uh, impact. And uh, what is actually not yet fully understood, because nobody's dared to do it, is really look at the whole complexity of, co of, of consequences, of impact, um, through all sectors of life, um, in all parts of the world. We have fascinating studies on the impact of food security, uh, spin-off of the climate change debates, of course. There is now more work uh, uh, taking place on this, on the impact of, of uh, oceans, on fisheries, and all this. But this really systemic look, or systems view, of what would happen if nuclear deterrence fails, that hasn't happened yet, and I think, uh, obviously, uh, the U.S., for example, has knowledge and capabilities to do this kind of work that is unmatched by anybody else. So there is plenty of constructive engagement that can be done specifically, I would say, also on the issue of, of, uh, of the positive uh, obligations aspect, the, the issue of environment uh, uh, and, and uh, um, the assistance to victims. So. Um, there is plenty that can be done, which doesn't implicate anyone in ratifying uh, the TPNW. It's a conversation that is urgently needed. I'm firmly of the view that as the risks are getting worse, and that's what we're talking about, we need to have more conversation about this, because this is actually what brings us, uh, what will bring the urgency that we try to do something against these risks as international community. And just on the issue of humanitarian impacts, I would just note that uh, Tong Zhao's colleagues at Princeton's program on science global security just released a fascinating and horrifying yeah. study of the effects of a nuclear exchange in China on the Chinese population that is uh, one of the f first and is, is very much worth a look. Um, so one thing I wanted to, there's one question here about the ongoing role of civil society uh, in the TPNW, and I want to expand this to other aspects of the nuclear disarmament enterprise. Um, as you know very well, NGOs played uh, a different kind of role. Uh, there's growing recognition of the role of NGOs at the CWC. We just mm -hmm. saw that a couple of weeks ago, um, our Chemical Weapons Coalition uh, chemical Weapons uh, Convention Coalition was a, a big presence there. Um, I mean, what do you think we need to do going forward? Um, uh, what do governments need to do? What do these treaty regimes need to do in order to better facilitate and incorporate a wider set of civil society views in the conversation based upon your experience mm -hmm. with the negotiation of the TPNW? I think this is clearly one of the things where democracies distinguish themselves from autocratic uh, um, regimes uh, where all of us uh, um, are usually open and encourage uh, to have debate and uh, expertise and input from other sources. And uh, I think we have seen that uh, when progress was possible in this field of work, in the last 20, 30 years, it usually happened because of um, uh, expertise uh, that went beyond uh, the government uh, delegates. So I think that is, that is extremely important. We now see, of course, some countries, Russia, Iran, uh, trying to put the brakes on this and trying to stop it. I think we need to really um, uh, work together to make sure that this open access, um, which is what should happen in the 21st century, that that is not lost. Um, uh, so, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. I, I think it is a 
extremely broadly shared recognition that this is only um, beneficial and enriching and multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, this, this, this is how we can tackle global issues and nuclear weapons and other uh, disarmament non-proliferation issues are not different. Great, and, and so one last question before we wrap up um, and go to, to break. Um, uh, I don't know if this is an easy or difficult question. But, uh, you know, coming out of the first meeting of states parties, um, you helped craft with the other states parties an ambitious uh, program to move the treaty forward. Uh, the second meeting of states parties is coming up. Uh, what kinds of things need to be accomplished to keep the treaty on track? Um, I mean, this young treaties face a lot of difficulties mm -hmm. in the early stages. What are the, you know, two, three, four keys to success over the next year or two in your view as, as Austria works with Mexico and others on the, the next meeting? It's actually an easy question. <laughs> um, um, I think, uh, and I've lost my thread, so it's not an easy question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm, the outcome of the first meeting of states, but this was strong and ambitious. The treaty has a lot of resource limitations. Um, there's not much financial resources there, and also the human resources available uh, are limited. Um, but that doesn't change the commitment. So the treaty will be gradually built and implemented, but maybe not as quickly as, uh, as some of us want. But that's normal, and it's not um, it's not diminishing the commitment uh, of the states parties uh, that are behind this treaty. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, what needs to, yeah, what I wanted to say is that it's actually, it is remarkable that it was possible to achieve this treaty given the significant uh, opposition um, that, uh, that we faced. Um, so I think that is, I think a remarkable accomplishment. Going forward, I think we need to demonstrate progress, and that will sometimes be faster, sometimes slower. Progress on universalization, progress on implementing and talking about uh, uh, in these working groups that we have established on the uh, verification aspect uh, within the scientific uh, advisor group, specifically on the aspects of victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, so that is progress. I think we are now getting into the probably slightly less um, sort of uh, fancy phase into more the, the steady building up of support of making this regime uh, and this new treaty uh, valid, continue to demonstrate its seriousness and gradually building it up. I think that is, that is progress. Uh, it's not probably going to be headline news, but this is, this is, uh, this is progress. And of course, the, 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 the really important aspect is that we need to keep this firmly grounded on the evidence around humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, because this is, this is what, this is, this is, these underlying, this underlying rationale is the strength of the treaty that helps it gain uh, legal traction, and it helps it uh, uh, build further political traction. Thank you very much, the, the, your efforts with the TPNW. It's a remarkable achievement. Um, your work through the years is, uh, we at the Armstrong Association welcome it in all of the different areas that you've, you've worked. Um, we can relate to your experience, uh, a small foreign ministry working on every issue under the sun. Uh, it's difficult, um, uh, but you're obviously extremely skilled and dedicated, and we thank you for that and for your remarks today. Please okay. join me.